Three, two, one. Did. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the uh, to the Borovoy conference. I can't see any of you, um, but I'm hoping you can hear me. And um, I'm hoping that um, you're all ready for uh, for a great conference. I'm going to uh, I'm going to say something about the Borovoy of the Borovoy conference uh, that we've named this conference af uh, after. Um, Alan uh, Borovoy was the executive director and general counsel of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association uh, from, this, from the 60s uh, right through until 2009, 41 years. Uh, but a lo long before he even took that job, he was um, fighting for civil rights um, everywhere from Halifax, uh, where he uh, fought for the rights of black people, of black Canadians in the 60s, and uh, for indigenous people, First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, in Northern Ontario and in Kenora in particular. And he was a very early defender of Aboriginal treaty rights. Alan um, said a couple of things that I want to tell you about. Firstly, he said there's no limit to what a few people can do, even with a small budget. We can go to our courts and change the laws. And that's what he did for 40 years. Hundreds and hundreds of laws were changed because of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association efforts in courts. And we still do that work. And that's our mandate. That's our that's that's the purpose of CCLA is we change unjust laws. Uh, if we think that it's unconstitutional, we will go to the courts and cr try and change it. If legislatures are thinking about changing it, then we'll tell them uh, what should be changed and how. He also said um, that we should attach a high priority to having fun for those of us who are in the business of anti-racism and in the business of fighting for equality. It, he said um, it's often such fun to kick the ass of the establishment and there's no reason to be deprived of that and i gotta tell you i totally agree i totally agree um we have a lot of fun at the ccla and i hope you can see some of that fun over the course of this conference so i'm i'm uh now going to uh we're, we're now going to have a land acknowledgement and uh, that's going to be done by our first ever uh, special advisor on Indigenous Affairs, uh, Mohawk lawyer herself, Verna George. So over to you, Verna. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Boravoy Conference on Rights and Freedoms. My name is Verna George and I'm a Haudenosaunee Mohawk woman from the Six Nations of the Grand. I've been requested to start off the conference with a land acknowledgement. It's become common practice to begin these events with a land acknowledgement. And while I find it extremely important, I would like to encourage you to not only hear the words, but think more of what that means. The land you are on now, historically, has been said to be here on nation and neutral territory. But today the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga occupy it after the French-English War for colonial dominion in the area eliminated the Huron Nation. And it has also been said that a treaty governs the land. What these stories tell you is that you must learn about the hard truths of history in order to help make a better future. No matter where you find yourself, there's a history of the land. 
So please take the time to learn the stories of the people so that you'll be able to pay it its proper respect. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Now I and back to you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Verna. Uh, thank you a lot for that. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, Justice Tullock. Uh, not that long ago, recently, well, maybe it wasn't that recent, but not that long ago, he shared an award stage with Desmond Tutu, the spiritual leader of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was the political leader. Bishop Tutu was the spiritual leader. You know, in some ways, maybe that's all that need be said about Justice Tullock. He gets awards alongside Bishop Tutu. I'm not going to list all of Justice Tullock's awards, all his honorary doctorates, all his degrees and his accomplishments. I'm going to say, however, that he's the first black judge to be appointed to the Ontario Court of Appeal in Ontario's history. That happened in 2012. At that time, he'd been on the Superior Court of Justice since 2003. But let's just consider that he was the first to the Court of Appeal in 2012 in this province. We've been a province since 1867. And white judges were appointed to the Court of Appeal for 145 years until one black judge gets appointed. That says something about Michael Tulloch, no question. It also says something about Ontario and it says something about Canada. The other thing I will say about Justice Tulloch is the role that he played in the subject of his talk. I'm not gonna forecast what he's going to say, I'd rather him say it, but I'm gonna say something that he probably cannot say or humility would disallow him to say, but I'll say it, his contribution to this issue, to the issue of policing and justice, of bias and discrimination against BIPOCs and all visible minorities, his contribution is going to go down in history as a turning point in the history of justice and equality and racism in this country. The Honorable Michael Tulloch has three characteristics that made his report unimpeachable. A fancy word for saying that his word could not really be doubted by anyone. Firstly, as a judge, he he is totally independent. He he gets to continue being a judge when he was appointed to do that report. He 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 knew he would go back to being a judge no matter what he said. He had total freedom to tell the truth. He didn't have to be political at all. He didn't have to make anyone on the left happy, anyone on the right happy, or anyone in the center, or even he didn't even have to make his own community happy. He was going to continue being an independent judge. This is one of the important principles of our independent judiciary in Canada. That's why it's important that our judiciary is not elected. They're not accountable to the people. They don't have to be popular. They just have to be right. So he got to spoke, speak the truth and he did. Secondly, as a black man, he had a credibility in authoring this report like no one else could. Lastly, he uh, was and remains a person of great power whose word carries great weight. So no matter what he wrote, this report was going to be taken seriously. But then he did more than that. He wrote a report that could be accepted by any executive council. In our country, we have three branches, a legislative branch, right? That's parliament in Ottawa. That's Queens Park in your province. And that's the government, sometimes called the cabinet, sometimes called executive council. He wrote a report that could be accepted by an NDP government, by a liberal government, or by a conservative government. And the point of the report 
in fact, was for that to happen, for our judicial branch to advise our executive branch, the government. He had to walk a line that would compel any government to make positive changes that could stand the test of time. And incredibly, he did that. It's a remarkable achievement. Now, let's hear about that report, its findings, its making, and from the man himself. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, all of you, um, I present the Honorable Michael Tullock. Great, thank, thank you so much, uh, Michael, um, our former uh, Attorney General for the province of Ontario and a very um, distinguished Canadian. I, I really appreciate um, the invitation uh, by the Civil Liberties Union um, to speak at this um, Alan Barbara uh, conference. Um, I, I just want to say how honored I am um, to be a part of this. Um, you know, I, 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 I I met, you know, when I was a student, I met Alan Barbara on, in, on numerous occasions. I was a member of the Civil Liberties Union when I was a student, and uh, as well as when I was subsequently a young lawyer at a Crown, I believe in the work uh, that you do as a, as, as a um, as a body, as a critically important um, institution within our democracy. Um, the work that you do, it holds, it spe you speak truth to power and um, you hold governments accountable uh, to ensure uh, that the rights of um, the least um, among our society are equal to those of all of us. And so the work that you do and the people that, that work within your organization are to be greatly uh, commended. Um, I just want to say how delighted I am also to speak to students. And um, I strongly believe that the future of any society is the young people and um, uh, how informed they are and how engaged they are in the issues of, of our day. And um, I can see that pretty much all of the changes uh, that are positive for our society. Uh, in most cases, they have been initiated um, uh, by the advocacy, um, by the challenges of, of, of our youth. And so, you know, I, I commend um, the young people in our, of our day uh, for, you know, what you guys are doing. And um, it's certainly an honor to speak with you. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, two very important um, tasks, and as, as Michael has indicated, um, uh, assignments that I was asked to undertake um, uh, by the Ontario government. One uh, involved a review, an independent review of civilian oversight of policing in the province of Ontario. And the other involved a review of procedures surrounding street checks are what um, we colloquially known as, as Cardin. Uh, back in, in 2016, uh, the Ontario government asked me to, to conduct an independent review of police oversight and police oversight like what this means is to take a look at the organizations that have been established in our province that 
were established to hold police accountable. And some of those organizations are the SIU, which is called the Special Investigations Unit. And this particular body uh, has the mandate of investigating interactions, investigating police officers who've been involved in situations involving the death, serious injuries, or uh, allegations of um, sexual assaults against a police officer. So this body investigates criminal conduct. And uh, another body uh, was a body that investigates what's what we call civil conduct or behavioral type conducts of police officers when police officers um, when members of the community or mem they, they, they lay complaints against the police officers um, civ civil behavior. Uh, for example, if they're rude to, 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 a, to a citizen or if they act in a way, although it doesn't meet the threshold of being a criminal uh, conduct, um, it's a conduct unbecoming of someone who holds uh, the office of a police officer. So, and 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 another body that I was that, that that's that that we call a uh, oversight body was uh, a body that conducts um, adjudicative uh, functioning of both the police services board, police chiefs, and members. Um, of, um, of police services vis-a-vis -vis complaints by their chiefs, right? And, and, and these are bodies that, are, that were established primarily, as I've indicated, um, to keep police accountable and, 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 and to ensure that we as a society have more confidence and uh, trust in the police and institution um, that serves us. So after extensive uh, consultations throughout the province in, in 2016, I released a report 11 months later containing over 129 recommendations. And um, those recommendations were primarily um, geared towards um, making police uh, oversight bodies more transparent um, and and more accountable. And the underlying theme of my recommendation with respect to that particular uh, report was that I believe that re the recommendations would benefit everyone, including members of, of the policing profession police service boards, as well as the society and the communities that they serve. Now, this bill, the, the, these recommendations, primarily most of them were introduced in a bill by the uh, then Liberal government, Bill 175, under an act called the Safer Ontario Act. When the the, the when they lost the election um, a couple of years ago, um, the legislation would, was put on hold or, or essentially uh, it was stopped. And um, then the new government under the uh, Conservative uh, political party, they then came into, into power and they effectively enacted a new legislation called the Com Comprehensive um, Ontario Police Act. And within this act, um, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't enact all of my recommendations as did the, uh, the, the Liberal government, but they did enact a number of them, uh, which I still think was better than, 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 than nothing. But I, I, I surely, would encourage you um, to read uh, my report on certainly on on um, on um, 
the, the, the police oversight and read, uh, you know, some of the uh, the media uh, reviews of that report, and um, and 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 you know, familiarize yourself with some of the recommendations that I feel uh, would make uh, policing better for all of us uh, within 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 our, our province. I, I strongly believe that the recommendations that I made, um, they were a blueprint um, for us as a society to have better policing. Um, so I want to just talk to you a little bit about uh, the approach that I took, and this approach is consistent in both uh, process, both the, the the oversight process and subsequent after I, I, I delivered my report on the um, civil independent um, review of police oversight. Uh, the same Liberal government, uh, they asked me again to do a subsequent review of a regulation that had been enacted to curtail the practice of carding. A carding was the arbitrary and random stopping of people um, by the police in, in, in the community on the um, on the pretext that uh, it would give the police more intelligence, gathering information on how to solve crimes. Now, the, you know, because of a lot of uh, complaints and the complaints came primarily from racialized people, marginalized people, racialized people such as blacks and indigenous people, brown people, Asian people who felt that there was a disproportionate amount of them being carded. And when I use the term carding, what it is is the police would randomly stop someone. They would then um, essentially take their information on a card and then they would file it in a record management system at the various police stations and um, these would be held indefinitely and the problem with this process is you know if you're carded it doesn't mean that you have been involved in any kind of criminal activity or any kind of um, you know bad behavior uh, all it means is that you have been documented by the police. And the problem with this process is, uh, throughout, the, throughout my review, I learned that it, it could have very deleterious effects on some of the people who were the subjects of this particular process. For example, you know, young people who were carded, um, you know, when, let's say five years later, uh, they apply for certain jobs or they want to get into certain types of professions and they need to do a police check. The police check would often come back as known to the police and by you receiving a report um, to a perspective that that's supposed to be submitted to a prospective um, employer that you're known to the police, it's, it's really the kiss of death. And in most cases, that was the end of that um, application process for that individual. And, you know, we, throughout that, that, that review process, I also was able to, you know, attend and sit and listen to a lot of, a lot of individuals from various communities, as well as attended like pretty much over 30 somewhat police uh, services, just so that I could understand the way their record system work. And what I one of the things that I learned that still resonates um, with me is the fact that a lot of good kids, a lot of good young people who try to become police officers, um, who some of the recruiters thought would be excellent officers, uh, who grew up in particular communities and who would be good to serve in those communities, they would they would not get through the screening process and the reason why they would not be able to pass through the screening process was because they had been carded the information had been inputted in the computer wrong that they were affiliated with people that were known as either gang people or they had relatives 
that that were known as such and and that would preclude them from ever getting through that process so you know just th that's just an overview of of um of 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 the two very, very important um, reviews that I undertook. Now, I want to just talk to you a little bit about the, my approach to the review and within the process. Now, a major theme of my report was, and of both reports, was the promotion of public trust and confidence in policing. Because I believe to be effective, police need to have the public's confidence and the public's trust. In my view, greater trust leads to greater legitimacy, greater community engagement, and ultimately greater public safety. And I'm of the view that the police is, is an important entity in our society, but they're there to serve the community, right? And so they don't act um, in, in a vacuum. They act with the tacit, tacit approval of the communities that they serve. And when we talk about police oversight, it is meant to contribute to all these outcomes by promoting the public's trust in the police. I certainly do not come up, I didn't come up with that idea myself, though rather I started with, I started the review and both reviews by reminding myself of the nine principles of modern policing, which were first established by Sir Robert Peel. And Sir Robert Peel is a, a former um, prime minister of, of Great Britain. And um, back in the, 18, the late 1800s, he along with some of his uh, advisors came up with nine principles in order to establish the London Metropolitan Police Service. And the, the whole prince, all of these principles were premised on the fact that the police is intricate, intricately tied to the communities that they serve. So the police is a community and the community is the police. That is the basis on which our police um, institutions in Canada was established, right? And it's very different in my view, from a paramil paramilitary model of policing where you see the police as a, you know, a form of, 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 of a, uh, you know, an army within the community, right? That, 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 when we watch television in the, U when we watch US television and, and, and we watch police shows, that, that, that's really, uh, the model that we that we see, but that's not the intent, and that's not the way it was initially intended to be evolved in Canada. And I think because our societies are so intertwined between the Canadian and the United States, what I think has has happened over the last few years is a devolution of 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 the distinction, and to the point where now. We see our police officers in Canada dressing in paramilitary type uniforms and their 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 vehicles, they almost look like like like, like military type vehicles and camouflage vehicles. And they wear uh, these these these, you know, in a lot of communities, even though there there is little of any crime, they, they have, you know, significantly large automatic uh, machine guns, right? Like that's not the way uh, Peel envision policing. Now, one of those principles includes the recognition that police officers are merely citizens in uniform, although they're citizens that their society is viewed to be of such exemplary character that they can be trusted to have special powers which are unavailable to other citizens or to other professions. This special authority bestowed on the police is at the behest of the public and is to be exercised in the public's interest. This is generally referred to as policing by consent. Now, policing by consent recognizes that the exercise of these special powers by the police depends on public approval. 
the public's acceptance of the police's role in society as legitimate is based on public trust and requires the respect and cooperation of the public. Now that trust is tested when police civilian interactions result in the serious injury or death of a civilian. And we see this, you know, recently in the United States with, with you know, for example, with the death of, uh, of, of, of uh, George Floyd. Well, you know, that has happened also in Canada and back in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, it's, 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 it's death of civilians, primarily young black men who had uh, been suffering from mental health issues at the hands of the police that gave rise to the protest and the outrage against, um, you know, the, 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 the way police police black communities that, you know, resulted in the formulation of, 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 of the special investigations um, unit or the SIU. And it also gave rise to what was then called the um, Police Complaints Commission, which, which, which was the independent uh, body that investigate misconduct by the police. So it is also tested when members of the public feels that an officer has been rude to them or behaved in a manner that was below the expected, expected standard of professionalism. Now, in such circumstances, members of the public cannot have confidence in the citizens who the public has allowed to be police officers without their being transparent and independent investigations into the actions taken by those police officers. Such investigations benefit everyone, including police officers. Greater transparency should lead, in my view, to greater public support which in turn should lead to better morale within a police service. So, you know, it's not just the community that benefits, but the police service itself benefits when there is trust and transparency in the way uh, police conducts themselves. In some situations, the investigation might not benefit the police officer. That would be a such situation where the investigation is determined that the officer acted improperly or without legal justification. In such a situation, the investigation should not sanction the behavior because such behavior detracts from the public support of all police officers. So it's not in anyone's interest, not the police interest, nor the society's interest, for the police institution or the society or the administration of justice uh, to condone bad behavior by the police, because what that does is it, it tests the entire uh, administration of justice and it brings the administration of justice into disrepute. It brings the profession of police in also into disrepute. So again, the main theme of both my reports were to promote public trust in policing. And that was both in terms of police oversight and in terms of, you know, the way street checks were 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 were, were conducted. And in, in that report, I recommended that the arbitrary uh, questioning and um, and 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 you know obtaining of people's uh, personal identifying information should be banned. And because I think that the deleterious effect of that practice had grave um, consequences to public's trust in policing. Now, in preparing both reports, I met with a great number of stakeholders. Um, in, in the first report I met with, in, in the first review, it, it in, in over seven months, I met with more than 1,500 individuals in 17 public consultations, over 130 uh, private meetings. In the uh, street checks review, I met with over 2,000 people. I, I attended and visited um, over 30 uh, police services and met with both police chiefs, their senior um, their senior officers, as well as uh, middle managers and 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 uh, frontline officers, uh, police officers that were engaged in community 
policing, as well as those that were engaged in very serious investigative um, roles. Um, just so that I could gain an understanding of the various stakeholders and the problems and what, you know, I would, you know, able to glean uh, from from these uh, types of uh, uh, the, fr from from the conflict between the communities and the police. To me, it was very important to include the voices of as many people as possible because I knew that many felt their I, I knew that many felt their frustrations had, got, had gone unheard for too long. I knew that many wanted a chance to share their experiences and other suggestions for improving police, uh, the police in oversight, as well as police in behavior within the community. I listened carefully to what I heard from all stakeholders. And in the end, uh, both my reports, uh, in my view, reflected the views and wishes of many stakeholders, including uh, communities, uh, members of what we call affected families, who, whose um, relatives died at the hands of the police or were seriously injured at the hands of the police. But also, it also included police and stakeholders um, and community advocates, institutional stakeholders. I met with uh, members of the, uh, of, of, of the Civil Liberties Union, uh, for example, because of the unique work uh, that this particular organization does and the fact that they are a a, a, a civilian advocate uh, for the rights of all uh, members of our society. No stakeholders got everything that they wanted. I suspect that there were recommendations made or not made in both my reports that satisfied and displeased almost, you know, different elements of of, 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 of the various stakeholders that I that I that I listened to. But ultimately, though, as a whole, I believe that the recommendations uh, had they and I, I still uh, hope in my view springs eternal uh, to have them all uh, implemented by 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 this government or or, subse or subsequent governments, because frankly, I believe that the recommendations in both report they reflect uh, what Canadians want, what the public wants, and they are also a culmination of, 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 of a literature review that we undertook that, that, that canvassed all the previous uh, reviews and undertakings and reports that were made within these areas by other distinguished um, uh, Ontarians and, 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 and Canadians and, 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 and uh, we also received written submissions and, 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 and which, which were reflected in both reports. As indicated, I made over 129 recommendations in the oversight report and I made over 144 recommendations in the street checks report. And um, I just want to hit on a couple of points. The first point that I think was of importance in was for the public to have confidence in police and, and police oversight. Justice must not only be done, but also be seen to be done. So there needed to be greater transparency in the process. And for too often, the public did not see justice as being done when it came to police, civilian and uh, community interactions. For many cases, when uh, someone died at the hands of the police, the SIU did not report to the public at all when they didn't lay any charges against the police officer. For those which it did report to the public, it did so in very brief news releases. The public was crystal clear that this was not enough. The proposed legislation provides for an open by default scheme, um, the SIU and others, and, and by the way, this is a recommendation that was adopted by this government as well, that the SIU and others report on what has happened unless there is good reason not to report, and which reason generally must be explained to the public. One of the problems that 
was endemic in the system was that reports were 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 produced by the director of the uh, SIU when ever they decided not to lay charges. But those reports, as I've indicated, were not dis dis disseminated to the public. So after I commenced that particular report, the first thing I recommended, even before I, I completed the review, and thanks to the government at the day of that of the day, they it, they, they, they not only accepted that, but they implemented it right away, was to release all the, uh, the current and uh, past reports of the SIU so that they can all be made publicly accessible. And this was, in my view, an effort to, to, to show uh, their commitment to transparency. Uh, there was widespread public mis mis misperception that the low criminal charges, you know, low criminal charge rate uh, per SIU investigation meant that the investigations were per performed incompetently or they were biased. In my view, a public release of information can address that misperception. When an SIU invest investigator or director decides not to lay a criminal charge, there is usually a good reason for that. And when the public does not know that reason, then the public becomes mistrustful of the police and that lack of trust then makes the day-to-day -day work of a police officer all the more difficult. Another recommendation that I made was that uh, there should be more uh, coroner's inquest. When police public interactions lead to a civilian's death, the coroner has a significant role to play towards promoting public accountability. A coroner's inquiry provides a forum at which family members, the police and the public can seek out uh, the facts of such interactions and provide recommendations to avoid such under unfortunate events in the future. It is a more humane venue for undercovering the truth behind these events than that provided by an SIU report. And often it is a coroner's inquest that the subject officer who is the subject of the investigation is able to provide an explanation of the events uh, for the first time. For family members and other affected members of the public, these inquiries then often contribute greatly to their healing. Without an inquest, these people are often just left to wonder. And many families have been frustrated by discretionary decisions not to hold inquiries into a family member's death. Currently, they are also, they're only required uh, when the deceased was detained by the police. But my recommendation was that all uh, situations that resulted in the death of a civilian as a result of the interaction of the police, whether or not um, you know, there was fault, uh, there should be a coroner's inquest. Now, another endemic problem in the process of civilian oversight of policing was the delay or the timeliness of, of the investigation. The timeliness of oversight investigations, particularly SIU investigations, was a major concern for affected persons and for the involved officers. A necessary uh, delay, in my view, benefited no one. And to remedy concerns about delay, I proposed uh, that the legislation provide the SIU uh, to aim to conclude investigations, including any final reporting uh, to the public within 120 days. And if the SIU has not concluded an investigation within 120 days, it should report to the public on the status of the investigation. The SIU should further report on the status of the investigation every 60 days thereafter until the investigation has concluded. Similarly, the Public Complaints Agency should conclude investigations within one year uh, with allowances for breaks in the investigation, while other investigations of higher priority are underway. 
Now, I also made recommendations that, you know, should expand the authority of the SIU to lay charges. Now, these unfortunately were not um, implemented uh, in the in the in the in the new legislation, but I will still tell you what I recommended. SIU uh, should be able to lay to, to, should be able to lay charges um, whenever even an individual that's an undercover police officer was 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 involved uh, in an incident. And we, we, we see the importance of this uh, just recently over the last year um, with the case of uh, Devonte Miller uh, in Durham, where the, the young man that lost an eye at, during the course of in, interaction with an undercover police officer and his brother. Unfortunately, the SIU's mandate was not invoked. Um, he, the, the officer was a, a, a he was a, uh, a police officer uh, with the Toronto Police. He lived in Durham. And um, it wasn't until six months after uh, the incident uh, when Devante Miller himself was, was criminally charged that his lawyer, um, Julian Faulkner, um, after reviewing the case and delving into it, he then um, made a complaint to the SIU and um, brought them in to independently investigate the case. And, and as a result, uh, charges were subsequently laid. And um, one of the police officers, well, the, the police officer brother was found guilty of an assault simpliciter. And I think uh, he was sentenced just within the last, I think it was the last, within the last 30 days in any event, uh, to nine months in jail. Now, um, that was something that, in my view, it you know it rocked uh, public confidence in certain communities because of the way the whole thing unfolded. Had my report recommendation uh, been been um, accepted, that issue would not have been a pro as as big an issue as it subsequently became. Now. There's another example. Consider this. After a, a horrific car crash, a police officer is not limited to charging a responsible driver with dangerous driving cause and death, a criminal code offense, or nothing at all. Yet, that has been the case for the SIU investigations of police officers. In the proposed legislation in th that, that, I, that I recommended, the SIU would explicitly be able to lay charges for any federal or provincial offense Un uncovered during an investigation. No longer, uh, I suggested uh, that the SIU director should face the stark contrast of laying a dangerous drive-in cause and death charge or nothing at all. Rather, intermediate charges such as careless drive-in under the Highway Traffic Act should have been available. Um, this was not adopted. Um, another, another, um, in my view, another thing that this would do, this change would ensure that police officers may be held responsible for breaking the law by independent investigators. And it also mitigates the danger that police officers will be overcharged with criminal uh, code offenses when other offenses such as highway traffic act offenses are more appropriate. So I thought this was a recommendation that would also benefit the officers because in cases where they're not, um, culpable for a, a, a more serious criminal offense, uh, the SIU would have an option um, to deal with, uh, with, with them under a provincial act, such as the Highway Traffic Act. Um, one of the other recommendations that I made that I thought was important was, 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 was to deal with, uh, to sanction uncooperative police officers, officers who would not cooperate within uh, the context of these independent investigations. There's a well-known expression that rules without sanctions are merely suggestions. And so too often this seemed to be the case in SIU investigations. SIU directors have been complaining for quite some time that uh, police officers and even police chiefs have not taken seriously their legal duty to cooperate with the SIU. 
And the proposed legislation that I that I that I'd suggested was based on recommendations um, from my report that you know there would be a, a monetary fine um, or a, a jail sentence uh, for officers um, or police services who who um, refused to cooperate with the investigated. Uh, body that was um, mandated to investigate them. Um, I also made other recommendations with respect to fair and independent uh, public complaints process and the fact that, you know, we should move towards uh, a, a full civilian uh, investigative process where um, the complaints body is not manned by ex-police officers, but, but within a five-year period they are manned or, or they're, 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 they're um, you know, the, the, the investigators uh, be, be fully civilian people, um, at, unlike the way they are now. And also, uh, my last recommendation, or one of my last one, was that um, the, the uh, oversight bodies uh, should, um, you know, there should be better cooperation and exchange of information between between them. I also recommended that the selection and training process for police officers should be enhanced, uh, not just police officers, but also the uh, police services board members, and that each body should be given uh, cultural competency training, uh, both in terms of Indigenous and First Nations um, cultural competence as well as racialized individuals and um, mar other marginalized groups uh, such as LGBTQ uh, community groups. So, you know, there should be, in my view, uh, cultural competency training so that police officers who are selected as, as well as the board members that are that that are that are that are um, tasked with with governing uh, police services mm -hmm. uh, be 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 equipped uh, to deal with the diversity of, uh, of 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 people within the communities that they serve. Um, you know, I strongly believe that had these recommendations, and I'm still hopeful that um, if they be accepted and um, be implemented at some point, uh, we in Ontario can be leaders uh, within. Um, you know, police in the pol the whole context of police in in North America. I can say this that uh, since my report, um, you know, with respect to especially street checks, um, a number of provinces have adopted regulations uh, that are consistent and follow uh, the Ontario model. Uh, Nova Scotia has. Um, so is, uh, I think, parts of uh, Quebec. And just last week, uh, I heard um, that um, Alberta came out, the, the Minister of Justice in Alberta came out um, with a uh, policy to ban uh, Cardin, right? Because uh, my report clearly um, articulate the inefficacy and um, almost the uselessness of, of 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 randomly stopping, searching, and 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 um, you know, and 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 retaining individuals' personal identifying information indefinitely. Um, it has, in my view, marginal diminishing return um, on investigative intelligence, and so that's a that's a practice that I'd recommend it uh, to be stopped. And the fact that it disproportionately affects uh, people of color uh, was another strong reason against uh, the continued um, endorsement of this kind of practice because what it does is it alienates uh, people from those communities um, from ever um, cooperating with the police. Um, they themselves, you know, when they become victims, you know, double victimize them because they don't want uh, to speak to the police. And we, we, we can have a society uh, that that is orderly, a society that is safe, where you have 
this this ch chasm between the police and the communities that they serve. So anyway, that that's that's it in a nutshell. That's just a summary of of, of both of these uh, reports, and um, I'm certainly open uh, for some questions um, from from the audience. And thank you very much again um, to the Civil Liberties Union and uh, the Alan Bar Bar Boravay, uh Conference for. Um, invited me and for allowing me this opportunity uh, to speak to you. Thank you to all of you for your time in listening. And thanks again, Michael. Uh, well, uh, well, thank you. I um, thank you so much, Justice Tullock. And I'm not, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, whether we're side by side or it's just me on the screen or it's just you on the screen. So I, I'm sorry if I end up, uh, if this ends up sounding awkward, but um, I'm going to say something and then uh, maybe uh, uh, we got about, I think we have four minutes until everything shuts down. So I oh, think I'm I'd sorry. rather, <laughs> no, 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 don't be sorry. We wanted to hear from you. I, 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 I think the most important thing that students ought to take away from this is what you talked about at the beginning in particular regarding the approach to policing. Is it uh, citizens with uniforms or, you know, who trust the police and the police get their trust or is it a paramilitary operation where it's us versus them? And, you know, you're obviously made the case for saying it's the first one, not the second one. But if there's a cultural shift, if you like, that needs to take place. It's that. And I think the only way to do that is through the is through changes to laws and uh, done by statute and municipal law and so on. Um, I wanted to. Uh, uh, so th that's uh, one thing I wanted to highlight for all the students, but I, I, I want to ask you this question. One of the students asked uh, and it was with respect to the police and dealing with people uh, with mental illness. Now, I know that there's a use of force issue that, for example, Justice Yakabuchi addressed in his report. But uh, to what extent did your reports address this issue of police training and uh, citizens with mental illness? So I talked about that and I made a recommendation um, for there to be you know, for, for, for what's called a situational table or a hub model of policing where, um, you know, police relinquish um, their responsibility to other types of first response teams, right? Such people that are better qualified to deal with mental health um, type issues, such as psychologists, um, sociology or uh, social workers and um, community organizations so not that they work you know exclusively of you know without them but work in tandem with with these organizations and one of my recommendation was that the, the government fund um these organize like, like these these social uh organizational groups right uh so that they can you know be it reallocate resources from frontline officers so that they can work with groups that um, work within this kind of, it's called the situational table model, right? Um, uh, that, that That's better equipped to deal with people with mental health. So 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 the police, of course, they, 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 they're trained to deal with the use of force, right? And so, you know, the whole emphasis should be de-escalation. But I think, you know, people that are trained uh, to deal with mental health uh, individuals who are in crisis, they they instinctively or automatically based on their professional training are able to de-escalate the situation way, way easier, I would think. Um, and, and, and studies have shown um, than officers who are not so trained. Uh, last uh, question that I'll ask, um, one of the students asked, uh, if they wanted to um, try to take a recommendation in your report that has not yet been accepted by the Ontario government and focus their efforts to get their government to accept that recommendation, if you had to pick, 
one or two, what would they be? OK, so OK, <laughs> a couple of them actually. OK, so, so 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 the first one is 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 OK, so 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 that's one of them. They need to they need to allocate resources towards more community, um, uh, more centered uh, resolution mechanisms, right? Um, such as that, you know, mental health type um, hub model. They need to they, they they need to make the mandate of the SIU much stronger because right now it's discretionary, right? In some in some situations on the part of the police service. And what that does is it is is it it, it, it takes away from um, any kind of um, it actually has the opposite effect of what we were trying to accomplish when the SIU was first established, right? Which was to create this independent investigative body. But then once you make it discretionary on the part of the police chief and his designate, then it loses its teeth, right? And so uh, it, it loses credibility. And I think in the current legislation, that's the way they've, they've, they've set it up. And um, in, in, some, in, in, in some cases, uh, include also uh, undercover officers. When you swear an oath, just like you and I as lawyers, right? We're always lawyers when 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 we sworn that oath, right? You're not an undercover lawyer or or or, or a lawyer on duty, right? So in my view, um, officers, regardless of whether or not they're on duty or undercover, they should be subject to the same level of independence uh, oversight. Um, so, th so those are those are two of the, the things. But I mean, you know, there's a great article. I would suggest that they Google this um, by uh, Wendy Gellis, where she looked at um, the, the the current legislation um, that the uh, current government has uh, tabled, and and compared it to my recommendations. And 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 I think that would be a good. Thing for the students uh, to to look at. Uh, that's great advice, and we're gonna uh, find that link to that article and uh, and make sure we get it out to all the teachers so that students can see where we're at in terms of the recommendations. I I know that over time uh, they are going to we're gonna talk about the Tulloch report recommendations, uh, like everybody knows what they are, and we at the CCLA know what they are, uh, but. Um, not only do I want to thank you for what you did in that report and all the credibility that you brought to that issue, but um, it's just such an honor that you would come and present to 700 students uh, from across the greater Toronto area in Durham and in Toronto um, and uh, let them hear firsthand from uh, the author of the report and give us a sense of what you did and why you did it. And uh, we're just very grateful uh, and feel like we're a little bit we're part of history ourselves by by chatting with you. Thank you. Well, again, I want to thank you and I want to thank all the students and their teachers who were a part of this um, this conference. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started my engagement in these issues as a student myself studying civic in school. And, um, you know, I, I know that a lot of these students are going to take this work that I've done to the next level so that we can have a much better and a much more just society, the society that was envisioned um, when the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, came into effect. So again, I want to thank you and, and, and each student should know the, 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 the effectiveness of their abilities to make change and uh, they shouldn't underestimate um, either their individual or the collective um, you know, abilities that we all have to make a difference. So again, thanks, Michael, and thank you for the work. Thank you. And thanks. No, thank you so much. Organization. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Talia Shamali. Thank you, April Julian. Uh, you can't see them right now, but they're the people who uh, made all this happen. Thanks to all the teachers and the students. And again, finally, thanks to, well, uh, Verna George for uh, the, um, the land acknowledgement. I know when you did a land acknowledgement at one of your, um, when you announced one of the reports, somebody yelled out Haudenosaunee 
uh, when you were doing the land acknowledgement. That's that's where Vern is from. So she she got this one right, yeah, and uh, you got yours right. But uh, well, you know what? I, I did it at every one of my meetings, by the way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I appreciate the fact that you guys respect and 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 do uh, the land acknowledgement, and um, you know the the First Nations were an integral part of our of our consultation and um, the communities. We, we went to all the communities in the north. Uh, so I, I have a really, really uh, dear place in my heart for for our community, for, for the First Nations people. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, tomorrow at the Borove conference. Um, just check with your teachers. Um, uh, they'll let you know what's next. Thanks again, Justice Tullock. Thank you. Thank you, sir.